Hi, everybody. Uh, I am recording this lecture on Tuesday, January 17th, uh, in advance of our risk analysis class, which begins on Wednesday, uh, January 18th. Welcome. Um, I've had the opportunity to visit uh, in a, a Zoom meeting with each of you individually. Um, sometimes some of you I've already had meetings with, some I have scheduled. There are a few people who have not scheduled meetings yet. Most of you have, so we're good. But if you haven't by chance scheduled a meeting with me, please do so. And you can do that either through the email that I sent to you or um, on our Moodle page, which I'll show you in just a minute. So this is going to be a relatively brief uh, video of how the course is going to work. And I think we've covered most of it in our individual uh, meetings, but I want to just make sure that I have everything kind of uh, put down in writing so that you'll be able to uh, refer back to it. All right, so this is our class Moodle page. The page is not open yet. Our in instructional technology department asks us to not open these until tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. So by the time you get this video, you may have uh, the Moodle page available to you as well. But basically everything that we have to do will be on this Moodle page. And um, we have documents, we have some different uh, URLs that we will access. And then this basic statement tells us how the class is going to work. So every week there will be up to four assignments to complete. They'll all be relatively quick um, and they'll all work toward the end of um, working to get us to where we understand risk analysis. And we've written uh, some sort of personal reflections and some ideas about what risk analysis looks like in our line of work or our line of interest. So every week, the up to four assignments, there's going to be some lectures and videos such as this, which you will watch um, today or tomorrow, actually on uh, January 18th. There's no face-to-face -face lecture or no synchronous lecture. So we do not have a time where we're going to meet. The first time that we will meet uh, will be on Monday, January 23rd at our regular class time, which I believe is 5.30 p.m. On that day, we will not have a in the classroom lecture. We will just meet either Zoom synchronously or you can watch the lecture at a different time asynchronously and it's completely up to you. Um, there's no, no harm, no foul for participating asynchronously. You'll get exactly the same shot in the same grade. Now, there will be times where we get to meet face to face should you choose. It's always your choice. Um, the first time that that will happen will be on uh, February 6th, Monday. It always be Monday, always be at 530, um, the synchronous Zoom and or the face to face lecture. So on Monday, February 6th, instead of having two, cho two choices for how to meet, you'll have three. The third choice will be face to face in lecture room, Math and Science 120. Uh, which is right across from my office, which is uh, in 126. However, um, just for different things of scheduling, it's just going to be um, not every week we are going to have a face-to-face -face lecture. Every week we will have either synchronous or asynchronous lectures, and I'll keep posted on our Moodle page, which is going to be happening that week. All right, so in the first part, we have uh, this introductory material that sort of tells you how to get around what risk analysis is about, more or less, and then um, tells you what to look for. Uh, week one, which begins tomorrow and ends on Sunday, so it's a short week, we'll have a video lecture, which I will post here, which the topic of which is how humans process risk and why risk is necessary. Uh, what's important about studying it. We do not have a face-to-face -face, uh, lecture, so you'll just watch the videos. And then there is a reading assignment. The text, it's not a textbook, but the book that I would like you um, to read for the first part of this class is called Deep Survival. And that textbook is, uh, if we take a look at our syllabus, there are different ways that you can access it for free, or you can uh, purchase it. It's a 20-year-old tech. It's a 20-year-old book, so it only costs a few dollars. But it, you don't in any way have to um, have to buy it. So anyway, the let's see. It's right here. 
uh, Larry Gonzalez, 2003, Deep Survival, Who Lives, Who Dies, and Why, True Stories of Miraculous Endurance, and Sudden Death. Okay, you can access it through the Internet Archive. If you go to this website, uh, https colon backslash backslash archive.org, you can set up a free account and you can borrow the book on that website for an hour at a time. So you can read it for an hour on your computer and then you'll have to close it down and you can open it up back immediately. So that is one free way to access the book. Uh, you can also access it through Wyoming Libraries at a wild search. You can contact um, Nancy Miller, who is our librarian on, at Northwest College, and she can also get you um, get you a, an e-copy of the book. If you have an if you have Audible, um, it's free on Audible, or you can buy it from Amazon for about six bucks. Uh, the other thing you can do, I own several copies of this book. So my office, like I said earlier, is SM 125, 126. It's inside of 125. And I've put copies of the book outside of my office. So if you want to borrow one, just feel free to come by and get it. Um, whether I'm here or not, just feel free to take it. If you send me an email and say, I took it, I have the book, that's great. Um, but you're welcome to it for the duration of the class. And if I get it back, that's great. And if I don't get it back, that's great. All right. So that's kind of the way that the course will work. All right. Now, this week, um, we're going to do a discussion forum and the discussion forum is to introduce yourself. So I have introduced myself on this forum to give you an example of what you, what I'd like to see from you. Um, and then um, you can also do something similar uh, for your own introduction. And then please comment on at least two of your uh, classmates introductory discussion forum entries. Now we do have a writing assignment and it will be due by Sunday, January 22nd. Uh, it will be an introduction. Uh, it can include some of the material that you had in the discussion forum, but then I'd like you to think about and to write a little bit about um, and a time when you had to take a risk and how you reacted to it. Or if you don't want to disclose anything personal, uh, you are welcome to write about something more theoretical. So, but we're gonna talk a little bit about what risk means and, um, and how, that, how you personally have been affected by risk in your life or something that intellectually is interesting to you. One thing that you might do if you're not interested in a personal disclosure is to talk about how risk is calculated in your line of work or in your field of study. Uh, for example, we have people in this class who are medical professionals. We have people in this class who are construction professionals. Uh, and we have people who um, are engaged in different professions and all of them have risk associated with them but the risk is handled very differently. The risk is different in nature and it's also handled differently. Now, as a business focus, when we talk about risk analysis, we're really talking more about the whole Warren Buffett buying stocks and making money sort of thing. But the same things that will trip you up with risk in your personal and professional life will trip you up when you're buying stocks. So this is getting into this idea of how humans process risk. Um, what I'm talking about right now. So that's part of this lecture in terms of uh, the introduction. So how do human beings process risk? Well, the answer is not very well. We tend to underestimate risk um, of certain types and we tend to overestimate risks of certain other types. And we also tend to mistake uh, opportunity and risk and danger for one another. So let me give you a couple of examples. When we talk about overestimating or underestimating risk, something that human beings just routinely do, um, as an example, is if you're going to fly on a commercial uh, aircraft, it's kind of an old saying among pilots that it's the riskiest part of that whole thing about taking a commercial flight is driving to the airport to catch the flight. And inherently that is extremely true. Um, driving to the airport is much more dangerous and your chances of being hurt or killed in a drive to the airport, um, and not just mile per mile, but like hour per hour, minute per minute, 
um, and incident per incident, your chance of getting hurt or killed in, in a car accident are much greater than your chances of getting killed or hurt in a commercial flight. But it's not as exciting or interesting um, and it doesn't have the cell news kind of value. So um, this is just a normal human thing. Another thing in terms of finance that we do as humans is um, like if you're buying stocks, for example, I've done this myself as a younger person, not so much anymore, but I sort of fall in love with stock or I'll hear about something that's just you know, too good to be true. Well, if something is too good to be true, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And um, you need to take that into account. But if you're familiar with a certain industry, uh, for example, later on, I'll talk more about this, but uh, my, my background is in petroleum engineering. And I used to sort of get really excited about oil stocks. And my husband worked in gold mining. Um, and we got, uh, at different times, we got really excited about gold mining stocks. Well, if you look rationally, if you stop being emotional about things like this, and you think about them rationally, uh, those kind of stocks are sort of like flash in the pans very often. Things that are less um, glamorous, for lack of a better word, uh, utilities, pharmaceuticals, um, Microsoft, uh, are, are big performers over the course of time. So if you really want to make money, what you need to do is to be very rational and sort of channel your inner Warren Buffett. I have some material on our webpage that you'll get to see about Warren Buffett, who's known as the Oracle of Omaha, or is a, he's been investing for um, decades and he just makes money, money, money. And he has a couple of things that he says, but one of them is uh, the only the only criteria that he uses, he just reads fiduciary prospecti day after day. And if something is undervalued, he buys it. If it's overvalued, he sells it. That's it. That is as simple as it is. He has another quote where he says, we don't have to be smarter than everyone else. Uh, we just have to be more disciplined. And so what he's really talking about is getting the risk, the idea of risk out of your emotional system and putting it into your this beautiful brain that all human beings have. So this big, these big frontal lobes that we have for processing information in a very rational way. So that's what risk analysis is all about, is channeling this idea of um, risk, taking it out of the, um, the morass of our emotions and putting it into our frontal lobes and processing it rationally. So what exactly is risk and why is it necessary? Well, everything associated with the possibility of having an opportunity, whether it's financial or um, in this case, in this class, we're mostly talking about financial uh, opportunities. Everything has a risk associated with it because none of us can see into the future. Uh, we do not really know what's going to happen. Sometimes things go along in trends, like um, the price of eggs, go up slowly over the course of the year. After Easter, they're cheaper, and then they go up slowly. And then the avian flu hits, supply chain issues come up, and the price of eggs go through the roof, okay? That is something that we can't, we wouldn't really be able to predict by looking into the future of eggs. If we've been buying eggs at the grocery store for um, 10 years, and we always see this trend, we say, oh, you know, after Easter, they go up in price before Easter, they drop after Easter, and then they go gradually over the year. And then there's a big bump right before Easter and there's a bump down after Easter. And we predicted that to happen forever and ever and ever. We would never see avian flu supply chain problems, worldwide pandemic. Um, so those sort of things are not really all that predictable. They're also very tied into sort of irrational um, or human factors that make them occur. Um, another example of that is uh, the price of oil. I have a student who is studying petroleum engineering. He's finished here at Northwest College. He's now at University of Wyoming, but he is from um, a country in Africa that's developing their oil resources. And he was discussing what happened when Russia invaded Ukraine. And he said, He's talking about specifically about the price and the value of oil because it just went through the roof because Russia was supplying 
uh, oil and natural gas to a lot of Europe. And so when that supply was cut off, the other supplies sort of were uh, overburdened. And so the prices went up. But the way that the student phrased it was, Russia invaded Ukraine and the next day the whole world changed. So those are the sort of things as far as risk, we can't really predict except to know that things are going to happen. Other types of risk, um, let's say that you are, um, let's say that you're farming, okay? And you're growing a crop. I use that example because Powell is a farming community, my husband farms, say that, um, your crop depends on a lot of things. It depends on good seed quality. It depends on good sunlight. It depends on consistent water supply. So maybe you have a 90% chance that you're going to get good seeds and you have a 90% chance that you're going to have good sunshine because, you know, you've, I mean, farmers are very aware of the weather. Um, and maybe you have a 90% or an 80% chance that you're going to get rain at the right time. Well, you might think, well, then I have an 80 or 90% chance of getting a good crop, but you really don't because there's each one of those things factors in. And so what are the chances that none of them is going to happen is really what we're trying to get at. So we can weight those things. Those are basically weighted or harmonic averages, and we are able to predict things like that pretty well. So those that's some of the stuff that we'll talk about um, in this particular class. But the other spectrum that I want to introduce at this point is um, the difference and similarity and relationship between risk, uh, danger, and opportunity. So in order to look for opportunity, you always have to sort of um, pull some risk into your life. You have to be willing to do stuff. Um, you know, it's like, once again, let's talk about the pandemic. One way to approach, one way to approach uh, living through a pandemic is to never leave your house and to never have any interaction with any human being. You're gonna miss a lot of opportunities. You're gonna miss opportunities for uh, work and earning money and social interaction, uh, but you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get COVID, right? Another way to um, react to it is to just say it's not true. And I'm not asking anybody to convert uh, their feelings about uh, COVID if you're, if you don't believe COVID is real, please just consider this an example of maybe the Spanish flu or um, the swine flu or some other infectious disease. Um, however, you can deny the danger, you can deny the opportunity, or you can be a reasonable person and try to make good decisions every single time. So what might good decisions look like? I'm gonna get off COVID because I think it's emotionally charged for a lot of people. So let's talk about if we were living through a recurrence of swine flu, okay? Where we know that there's some danger, we know that it's especially dangerous for people who have risk factors such as diabetes. Um, so we wanna be careful and yet we don't want to uh, isolate ourselves or isolate our, our family in, within a house for years at a time until the flu happens to go away. So, um, so risk is always necessary. Every time, every time you go to the grocery store during a swine flu epidemic, you're risking getting the swine flu. Um, if you take a vaccine for the flu, you're risking it not being effective, or you're risking side effects from the vaccine, uh, or you're risking, you're also having to maybe pay for it. I mean, in some places, those vaccines are considered a matter of public health. And so there's no cost to you, but in other places, there's a cost to you. So you have to weigh all of those things. So the best place to weigh them is the best way to weigh them is intellectually. And so that's what we're really going to be talking about in this course. So to finish up my lecture today uh, for our first week together, um, I'm going to write a little paper about a risk I took at one point and I'll post it for you uh, by the end of the week so that you can look at it as an example and think about it um, for yourself. But think about this in terms of that and the reading that you're doing in Deep Survival. Deep Survival is a really interesting book. Um, and one thing that he talks about sometimes is uh, snowmobiling and the risks that people will sometimes take on snowmobiles. And there's a couple of things that play into our minds uh, incorrectly. One of them is, is that snowmobiling is such a great joy and gives people such an emotional hit uh, that they sometimes will almost be overwhelmed with the um, 
with the joy of snowmobiling and they'll do dangerous things because they just kind of like don't want to think about that they want to make the highest mark they want to go a little bit farther they want to just do it because it's such a pleasure the other thing um that's really that happens a lot and i'd like you to think about this as i close my talk today is if you get away with something once you feel like you're going to get away with it again and really the exact opposite is true if you take a risk i mean or subject yourself to danger i'm not i'll separate those out later on but if you do that once and you get away with it human being human tendency is to think well then maybe i'll get away with it again the actual thing to do is the actual rational thing to do would be to say, boy, I got really lucky. Um, I shouldn't do it again because your number may be coming up. All right. So another thing that we'll talk about in terms of risk analysis later on is gambling. Gambling does a lot of the same things as snowmobiling does that he talks about in deep survival. It sort of ignites people's joy circuits, gets them all, uh, all excited to do it because, you know, you win 200 bucks and then it's just like you're on a roll and everything's going your way and you feel really great. So um, there's some thoughts about that. But I would close with the idea that um, when I teach problem solving and statistics, I talk a lot about gambling. And the question I always ask my students is, why does a legitimate gambling house never cheat? And the answer is, because they don't have to. They've already figured out the odds. They've, uh, they know that in the scheme of things they're gonna win. And if you win 200 bucks or $500 or $5,000, it's advertising for them. So ultimately at the end of the night, they're the ones who are going away with the big sacks of money, not you. So you may get a big sack of money one day, but there's a whole bunch of other people that are putting in bags of money so that you can do that. And the chances are you're not gonna win. So there you go. And uh, they can deal with it rationally. Risk analysis. You and I as patrons do not deal with it rationally. We're dealing with it out of our gut or out of our heart or out of our emotional system. So read uh, the chapters in, uh, in Deep Survival. Um, respond to the forum. Read the example paper that I will be posting by Friday and write a paper of your own. And if you have any questions, get a hold of me. Use Calendly on, uh, um, on my email to schedule a meeting with me or uh, give me a call. Well, give me a text. Calls don't really work as well. But my number is 307-272-1833. If you text me, I'll answer you back really quickly. And if all else fails, please email me. So I'm looking forward to this class, looking forward to working with you. And uh, we'll talk to you real soon.